Sanctification. Sanctification is to be holy, which is to be separated, set apart for God and His purpose. Sanctification is a gracious work of God in setting the believer for Himself and for the service in the world. When we are saved initially, we are sanctified. Sanctification includes the critical work of the Holy Spirit at conversion, whereby we are set apart or born of the Spirit. Once that has taken place, the Holy Spirit continues to work in us to make us more holy. That is the process of sanctification which continues throughout our lives. How sanctification takes place. At the moment we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord and believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we were saved, sanctified or set apart from sin, Satan and this present evil age and unto God for his good pleasure and use. When God created us, we were for him and for his purpose. Through Adam's fall, however, we lost our holy position and became corrupted in our nature and thus were no longer for God and his purpose. Therefore, when God saves us, he sanctifies us both outwardly in our position and inwardly in our disposition, in our nature. He separates us outwardly from the world, from the fallen human race. He also saturates us inwardly with his holy nature, making us his holy people, as holy as he is. Types of sanctification. Note there are three aspects in sanctification of a believer, which are depicted below, with scripture supporting each phrase of sanctification, often described as the three tenses of salvation, past tense, positional sanctification, a time of justification by faith, a one-time event when a person passes from spiritual death to spiritual life, becoming a new supernatural creation in Christ. It is also known as initial sanctification and past tense salvation. We have been saved. Present tense. Progressive sanctification that begins at the time we are justified by faith and continues throughout our life on earth. It is also known as growing in Christ likeness and present tense salvation. We are daily, moment by moment, being saved. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Future tense, perfect sanctification, most commonly known as glorification, which is a one-time event. A synonym is perpetual, eternal sanctification. Positional sanctification is the once for all setting apart of sinners as saints at the time of salvation. When they are taken out of Adam and placed into Christ and his righteousness is imparted to them. This aspect of sanctification is possessed by every believer the moment of conversion and we will never be more saved than at the moment we put our trust in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved and not because of who we are. Positional sanctification means that in Christ we have been set apart to belong to God and to serve Him. Positional sanctification never changes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You can hardly call the people in the church at Corinth godly people. Some of them were getting drunk. Some of them were living in immorality. Some of them were suing each other. And yet, Paul addressed them as church, called out people, sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is positional sanctification. It never changes. Progressive or practical sanctification is the process by which believers are set apart by God as a special people to grow spiritually in personal holiness and to develop 
Christ-like character. This process continues as long as we live. Progressive sanctification is the daily growth in grace, so that believers are becoming in practice more and more set apart for God's use. The primary means of sanctification is the Holy Word. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and makes the child of God like the Son of God. As we walk in the Spirit and obey the Word, stated another way, progressive sanctification is the Holy Spirit working in our lives to produce holiness in our walks. Progressive sanctification is different from positional sanctification. In that positional sanctification is entirely the work of God, while progressive sanctification includes human responsibility. Progressive sanctification is the process of being confirmed to the image of Christ. This is Christian growth, putting away sin and putting on godliness. All believers are exhorted to pursue progressive sanctification, for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. This aspect of a sanctification is a matter of choice to the believer. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepare unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Perfect Sanctification This is the final perfection of the believer, which will take place at the return of Christ. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect sanctification is a plan and purpose of God for every believer. This phase of sanctification cannot and will not be attained while we are in our mortal bodies. However, it will be accomplished what God started in the believer, He will finish. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Perfect sanctification will be the completion of what God started in us on the day of our salvation. Like positional sanctification, this is wholly the work of God. At Christ's coming, every believer will receive a new body that will have no sin. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Christian will no longer have to resist sin within or to grow toward perfection. His sanctification will be complete. He will be holy and forever set apart to God from sin. Perfect sanctification, of course, will take place when we see the Lord Jesus Christ at His coming, and we will be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. These three aspects of sanctification relate to each other because we know we have been set apart by God and because we know that Jesus is coming and we will be like Him. We want to keep our lives clean today. We want to seek to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Nature of Sanctification Sanctification is that inward spiritual work which the Lord Jesus Christ works in a man by the Holy Spirit. When He calls him to be a true believer, He not only washes him from his sins in His own blood, but He also separates him from His natural love of sin and the world, 
puts a new principle in his heart and makes him particularly godly in life. The instrument by which the Spirit affects this work is generally the Word of God. Though he sometimes uses afflictions and providential visitations without the Word, the subject of this work of Christ by his Spirit is called in Scripture a sanctified man. The Lord Jesus has undertaken everything that his people's soul required, not only to deliver them from the guilt of the sins by his atoning death, but from the dominion of their sins by placing in their hearts the Holy Spirit, not only to justify them, but also to sanctify them. He is thus not only their righteousness, but their sanctification. Let us hear what the Bible says. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. Christ has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present he holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Sanctification is the invariable result of that vital union with Christ which true faith gives to a Christian. He who abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. The branch which bears no fruit is no living branch of the vine. The union with Christ which produces no effect on heart and life is a mere formal union which is worthless before God. The faith which has not a sanctifying influence is a dead faith because it is alone. It's not the gift of God. It's not the faith of God's elect. In short, where there is no sanctification of life, there is no real faith in Christ. True faith works by love. It constrains a man to live up to the Lord from a deep sense of gratitude for redemption. It makes him feel that he can never do too much for him that died for him. Being much forgiven, he loves much. He whom the blood cleanses walks in the light. He who has real lively hope in Christ purifies himself even as he is pure. Character is no better than. Sanctification is the outcome and inseparable consequence of regeneration. He who is born again and made a new creature receives a new nature and a new principle and always lives in a new life. He who is born of God does not commit sin, does righteousness, loves the brethren, keeps himself and overcomes the world. Simply put, the lack of sanctification is a sign of non-regeneration. Where there is no holy life, there has been no holy birth. This is a hard saying, but a biblical truth. Whomever is born of God, it is written, cannot sin, because he is born of God. Sanctification is the only certain evidence of that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is essential to salvation. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Spirit never lies dormant and idle within the soul. He always makes his presence known by the fruit he causes to be born in heart, character, and life. The fruit of the Spirit says, Paul is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and such like. Where these things are to be found, there is the Spirit. Where these things are wanting, men are dead before.
God. Sanctification is the only sure mark of God's elect. Elect men and women may be known and distinguished by holy lives. It is expressly written that they are elect through sanctification, chosen to salvation through sanctification, predestinated to be confirmed to the image of God's Son, and chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world that they should be holy. Hence, when St. Paul saw the working faith and laboring love and patient hope of the Thessalonian believers, he said, I know your election of God. Sanctification is a reality that will always be seen. A truly sanctified person may be so clothed with humility that he can see in himself nothing but infirmity and defects. Like Moses, when he came down from the mount, he may not be conscious that his face shines like the righteous. In the mighty parable of the sheep and the goats, he may not see that he has done anything worthy of his master's notice and commendation. When saw we you are hungry and fed you, but whether he sees it himself or not, others will always see in him a tone and taste and character and habit of life unlike that of other men. Sanctification is a reality for which every believer is responsible. In saying this, I would not be mistaken. I hold as strongly as anyone that every man on earth is accountable to God and that all the lost will be speechless and without excuse at the last day. Every man has power to lose his own soul, but while I hold this, I maintain that Believers are eminently and peculiarly responsible and under a special obligation to live holy lives. They are not as others, dead and blind and unrenewed. They are alive unto God and have light and knowledge and a new principle within them. Whose fault is it if they are not holy but their own? On whom can they throw the blame? If they are not sanctified but themselves, God, who has given them grace and a new heart and a new nature, has deprived them of all excuse. If they do not live for His praise, if the Savior of sinners gives us renewing grace and calls us by His Spirit, we may be sure that He expects us to use our grace and not to go to sleep. It is forgetfulness of this which causes many believers to grieve the Holy Spirit and makes them very useless and uncomfortable Christians. Sanctification is a thing which admits of growth and degrees. A man may climb from one step to another in holiness and be far more sanctified at one period of his life than another, more pardoned and more justified that he is when he first believes he cannot be. Though he may feel it more, more sanctified he certainly may be, because every grace in his new character may be strengthened, enlarged, and deepened. This is the evident meaning of a Lord's last prayer for his disciples when he used the word sanctify them and of St. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. The very God of peace sanctify you. In both cases, the expression plainly implies the possibility of increased sanctification. Sanctification depends greatly on a diligent use of scriptural means. The means of grace are such as Bible reading, private prayer, and regular worshipping God in church, wherein one hears the word thought and participates in the Lord's Supper. I lay it down as a simple matter of fact that no one who is careless about such things must ever expect to make much progress in sanctification. I can find no record of any eminent saint who ever neglected them. 
they are appointed channels through which the Holy Spirit conveys fresh supplies of grace to the soul and strengthens the work which He has begun in the inward man. Sanctification is a thing which does not prevent a man having a great deal of inward spiritual conflict. By conflict, I mean a struggle within the heart between the old nature and the new, the flesh and the spirit, which are to be found together in every believer. A deep sense of that struggle and a vast amount of mental discomfort from it are no proof that a man is not sanctified. No, rather I believe they are healthy symptoms of a condition and prove that we are not dead but alive. A true Christian is one who has not only peace of conscience but war within. He may be known by his warfare as well as by his peace. In saying this, I do not forget that I am contradicting the views of some well-meaning Christians who hold the doctrine called sinless perfection. I cannot help that. I believe that what I say is confirmed by the language of St. Paul in the 7th chapter of Romans. That chapter I commend to be careful study of all my readers. I am quite satisfied that it does not describe the experience of any unconverted man or of a young and unestablished Christian but of an old experienced saint in close communion with God. None but such a man could say, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Sanctification is a thing which cannot justify a man, and yet it pleases God. The holiest actions of the holiest saint that ever lived are all more or less full of defects and imperfections. They are either wrong in their motive or defective in their performance and in themselves are nothing better than splendid sins, deserving God's wrath and condemnation. To suppose that such actions can stand the severity of God's judgment, atone for sin and merit, heaven is simply absurd. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The only righteousness in which we can appear before God is the righteousness of another. Even the perfect righteousness of our substitute and representative, Jesus Christ the Lord, His work and not our work, is our only title to heaven. This is a truth which we should be ready to die to maintain. For all this, however, the Bible distinctly teaches that the holy actions of a sanctified man, although imperfect, are pleasing in the sight of God. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey your parents, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. We do these things that are pleasing in His sight. Sanctification is a thing which will be found absolutely necessary as a witness to a character in the great day of judgment. It will be utterly useless to plead that we believed in Christ unless our faith has had some sanctifying effect and been seen in our lives. Evidence, evidence, evidence will be the one thing wanted when the great white throne is set. When the books are opened, when the graves give up their tenants, when the dead are arranged before the bar of God without some evidence that our faith in Christ was real and genuine, we shall only rise again to be condemned. I can find no evidence that will be admitted in the day except sanctification. Sanctification in the last place is absolutely necessary in order to train and prepare us for heaven. Most men hope to go to heaven when they die, but few, it may be feared, take the trouble to consider whether they would enjoy heaven if they got there. Heaven is essentially a holy place. Its inhabitants are all holy. 
its occupations are all holy. To be really happy in heaven, it is clear and plain that we must be somewhat trained and made ready for heaven while we are on earth. The notion of a purgatory after death, which shall turn sinners into saints, is a lying invention of man and is nowhere taught in the Bible. We must be saints before we die. If we are to be saints afterwards in glory, the favorite idea of many that dying men need nothing except absolution and forgiveness of sin to fit them for the great change is a profound delusion. We need the work of the Holy Spirit as well as the work of Christ. We need renewal of the heart as well as the atoning blood. We need to be sanctified as well as to be justified. Visible Evidence of Sanctification True sanctification then does not consist in mere talk about religion. True sanctification does not consist in temporary religious feelings. True sanctification does not consist in outward formalism and external devoteness. Sanctification does not consist in retirement from our place in life and renunciation of our social duties. Sanctification is not merely the occasional performance of right actions. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitual respect to God's law and habitual effort to live in obedience to it as a rule of life. Genuine sanctification will show itself in an habitual endeavor to do Christ's will and live for Him. Genuine sanctification will show itself in an habitual desire to live up to the standard which St. Paul sets before the churches in his writing by his particular percepts. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitual attention to the active graces which are Lord so beautifully exemplified, and especially to the grace of charity. Genuine sanctification in the last place will show itself in habitual attention to the passive graces of Christianity. Differences, Justification, Sanctification Both proceed originally from the free grace of God. It is of His gift alone that believers are justified or sanctified at all. Both are part of that great work of salvation which Christ in the eternal covenant has undertaken on behalf of his people. Christ is the fountain of life from which pardon and holiness both flow. The root of each is Christ. Both are to be found in the same persons. Those who are justified are always sanctified. Those who are sanctified are always justified. God has joined them together and they cannot be put asunder, both beginning at the same time. The moment a person begins to be a justified person, he also begins to be a sanctified person. He may not feel it, but it is a fact. Both are alike necessary to salvation. No one ever reached heaven without a renewed heart as well as forgiveness, without the Spirit's grace as well as the blood of Christ, without a fitness for eternal glory as well as a title. The one is just as necessary as the other. Such are the points on which justification and sanctification agree. Let us now reverse the picture and see wherein they differ. Justification is the reckoning and counting a man to be righteous for the sake of another. Even Jesus Christ the Lord, sanctification is the actual making a man inwardly righteous, though it may be in a very feeble degree. The righteousness we have by our justification is not our own, but the everlasting perfect righteousness of a great mediator, Christ, imputed to us and made our own by faith. The righteousness we have by sanctification is our own righteousness, imparted, inherent, and wrought in us by the Holy Spirit, but mingled with much infirmity and imperfection. In justification, our own works have no place at all, and simple faith in Christ is one thing needful. In sanctification, our own works are of vast importance and God bids us fight and watch and pray and strive and take pains and labor. 
Justification is a finished and completed work, and a man is perfectly justified the moment he believes. Sanctification is an imperfect work comparatively and will never be perfected until we reach heaven. Justification admits of no growth or increase. A man is as much justified the hour he first comes to Christ by faith as he will be to all eternity. Sanctification is eminently a progressive work and admits of continual growth and enlargement so long as a man lives. Justification a special reference to our persons, our standing in God's sight and our deliverance from guilt. Sanctification a special reference to our natures and the moral renewal of our hearts. Justification gives us a title to heaven and boldness to enter in. Sanctification gives us fitness for heaven and prepares us to enjoy it when we dwell there. Justification is the act of God about us and is not easily discerned by others. Sanctification is the work of God within us and cannot be hid in its outward manifestation from the eyes of men. Two aspects of sin. To begin with, Paul pointed out that there are two different aspects to sin. There are sins of the flesh and there are sins of the spirit. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. In other words, we have here the prodigal son. He was guilty of sins of the flesh. And the elder brother, he was guilty of sins of the spirit. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, that was a sin of the flesh. When David numbered the people in pride and rebelled against God, that was a sin of the spirit. There are sins of action and there are sins of attitude. Sins of the flesh. Let's talk about these sins of the flesh. By flesh, of course, Paul meant the old nature. When you and I were born again, God gave us a new nature. But he did not change the old nature. You and I are capable of sinning today. We don't want to because the desires of the new nature have lifted us higher. But now we see what sin is really like. The word of God and the spirit of God have revealed to us the awfulness of sin. And we want nothing to do with it. But we are capable of sinning. Everything the Bible has to say about the flesh is negative. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. We are to have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh is that which produces sins. Out of the heart of man, the old nature comes all sorts of evil things. Lying and lust and all the things that wreck our lives and ruin our testimonies. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 has recorded the works of the flesh and 17 different sins are mentioned there. In Romans chapter 1 verses 19 to 32, at least 24 different sins are mentioned. The flesh is very productive when it comes to producing sin and the flesh cannot be changed. We need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. The sins of the spirit. There are also sins of the spirit. You and I may not be guilty of drunkenness, adultery, gluttony or laziness. But how about pride, stubbornness or criticism? G. Campbell Morgan used to call the sins of the spirit sins in good standing. You have to be very careful about them. You may not be a prodigal son, but you might be an elder brother. So critical that you won't fellowship with your brother. There are two aspects of sin and we have to deal with them both the filthiness of the flesh and also the filthiness of the spirit two aspects of holiness second corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 reveals that there are also two aspects to holiness there is a negative aspect let us purify ourselves and a positive aspect perfecting holiness out of reverence for god cleansing let us purify ourselves means once and for all, let us cleanse out of our lives the defilement of sin. In fact, Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. 
This is a farm picture. You don't yoke an ox and an ass together. They have two different temperaments, and they are not going to be able to work together. Believers should not be yoked together with unbelievers in marriage or in business. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? The word common is a commercial term. It means partnership. Righteousness cannot be in partnership with unrighteousness. For what fellowship can light have with darkness? The word communion means to have in common. It is a family term. We do not have anything in common with unsaved people other than our humanity. Because we are light and they are darkness, we have righteousness and they have unrighteousness. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? The word harmony here is a musical term. We aren't even playing in the same orchestra with the unsaved. We aren't following the same conductor or reading the same score. Therefore, how can we ever make music together? It is such a sad thing when believers try to manufacture harmony with unbelievers. You can't make a beautiful home that way. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God had said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So the first aspect of holiness is to cleanse ourselves. This doesn't mean we become isolationists. We must live in the world, but not like the world. We are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We must have contact, but not contamination. This is what the Bible calls separation. Setting ourselves apart and saying, I am not going to be yoked with unbelievers. I don't agree with them. I am not going to try to make music with unbelievers because I just don't have the same conductor that they have. Separation, not isolation or insulation. But biblical separation means cleansing ourselves. Often we pray, oh God, cleanse me. And God comes back and says, why don't you cleanse yourself? Get rid of these videos. Get those books and magazines out of your library. Put away these things and be separate. Isaiah 1.16 says, wash and make yourselves clean. Living in his presence. It isn't enough to be negative like the Pharisees and not do certain things. We have to be positive, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We have here a consistent, constant process. Holiness is what God is, and as we grow in holiness, we become more like God. In the Old Testament tabernacle, there was a laver. The laver made cleansing possible. That's negative, but there was also a holy of holies. The priest was only allowed to enter there once a year. You and I can enter into God's presence at any time. In fact, we should live in His presence. The laver cleanses us, but being in fellowship with God in the Holy of Holies perfects us. Don't be afraid of holiness. Holiness is not the brittle piety that some people manifest, a religiosity that is artificial. No, holiness is wholeness. Holiness is to your soul what health is to your body. There are two aspects to sin, sins of the flesh and sins of the spirit. And there are two aspects to holiness, cleansing ourselves and perfecting holiness. Two aspects of obedience. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 reveals two motivations for obedience, love of God and fear of God. Love of God. Why should we cleanse ourselves? Why should we perfect holiness? Because of God's love. Since we have these promises, dear friends, what promises? Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean things and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Notice the promises here. When you were saved, God became your father. But he cannot be a father to you if you are disobedience. We parents long to love our children and share the very best with them, but sometimes they won't let us. So God promises to receive us into a deeper fellowship. If we are obedient, He will be a father to us and we will be His sons and daughters. Not only is His love available to us, but His power is also available to us. 
for he is the Lord Almighty. He promises to receive us. He promises to bless us. He promises a deep fellowship with him through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit. Whoever has my commands and obey them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That is a deeper fellowship with God, because we are cleansing ourselves and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Fear of God the first motive for obedience is reverence. The second is fear. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We don't have just God's promises. We also have God's discipline. If we do not walk in separation, God has to discipline us. He does not want us to become prisoners. He wants us to be sons and daughters who walk with Him. He says, Therefore come out from them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. We do this out of reverence for God. There is a sweet, deep fellowship with God that is so precious. There is also a walk with God that demands fear and reverence. We ought to reverence our Father in heaven because it is He who has commanded us to be holy. This is practical, progressive sanctification, being aware of the sins of the flesh and of the spirit, being diligent to cleanse ourselves. We are motivated by the love of God because of His promises and by the fear of God because of His discipline. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. The three tenses of sanctification, position, past, present experience, future certainty. We go according to past, present, and future. So the past sanctification is a condition. Present sanctification is a process. Future sanctification is a promise. In the past it's justification. The present it's sanctification. In the future it's glorification. In the past it's one time event occurs in the past. In the present daily event moment by moment occurs in the present. Future one time event or blessed living hope to be fulfilled in the future. Past and salvation have been saved. Present and salvation I am being saved. Future and salvation I will be saved. Three stages of sanctification. We read different verses for the past, present and future. You can go through this slide well to understand. I do not like to go in details, but uh, there's a slide for you to understand. It's self-explanatory. William MacDonald has a straightforward explanation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We should also strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What is the holiness referred to here? To answer the question, we should remind ourselves that holiness is used of believers in at least three different ways in the New Testament. First of all, the believers become positionally holy at the time of his conversion. He set apart to God from the world. By virtue of his union with Christ, he is sanctified forever. This is what Martin Luther meant when he said, My holiness is in heaven. Christ is our holiness. That is, as far as our standing before God is concerned. Then there is a practical sanctification. That is progressive sanctification. This is what we should be day by day. We should separate ourselves from every form of evil. This separation must not be legalistic, me trying harder to do some sin, etc., but should be enabled by leaning continually on the supernatural power of the indwelling Spirit of Christ. This holiness should be progressive. This is, we should be growing more and more like the Lord Jesus all the time. Finally, there is complete or perfect sanctification, glorification, future and salvation. This takes place when a believer goes to heaven. Then he is forever free from sin. His old nature is removed and his state perfectly corresponds to his standing. Now which holiness are we to pursue? Obviously, it is practical sanctification that is in view. 
We do not strive after positional sanctification. It is ours automatically when we are born again. And we do not strive after perfect sanctification. That will be ours when we see his face. But practical or progressive sanctification is something that involves our obedience and cooperation. But even this obedience enabled by the Spirit, giving us a desire to obey and the power to obey. We must cultivate this holiness continually. The fact that we must follow it is proof that we do not fully attain it in this life. The process of sanctification. God sanctifies us through the working of the Holy Spirit in us in three steps. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. Romans chapter 15 verse 16. Before we believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God sanctifies us by convicting us concerning sin, righteousness and judgment, thereby causing us to repent to God, to obey Christ and to receive Christ's redemption. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. John 16, 8 to 11. When we believe in the Lord and are baptized, we are separated from the world to God by Christ's redeeming blood and God transfers us out of Adam into Christ thereby sanctifying us positionally. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 in 1 Corinthians chapter 113. Romans 6 3. After we are regenerated through our faith in Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit continues to sanctify us dispositionally through our entire Christian life, daily imparting into us God's holy life and holy nature until our entire being, spirit and soul and body is sanctified. The results of sanctification. We become a particular people, a holy nation, a treasure for God's possession. God's holy nature becomes our nature and we spontaneously live a holy life, a life that expresses God in His holiness. We become God's sons as brothers of Christ, thus fulfilling the purpose for which God chose us and predestinated us. Romans 8.29 We become the glorious bride of Christ, holy and without blemish. Ultimately, we will become the New Jerusalem, the Holy City, and the wife of the Lamb, Christ. Conclusion May the Lord bless these words and keep it in our midst.